as part of our scripture reading for the message today, we encounter Mary Magdalene suffering anguish over the death of Christ and the supposed removal of his body with no expectation that he is alive. Amid her suffering, the risen Jesus not only appears to her, but calls her by name. One of the first words Jesus utters after the resurrection is the name of an individual person, Mary. So friends, as we prepare our hearts for worship and as we celebrate the resurrection this morning and all through the year, may we quiet our hearts to hear the risen Jesus calling us by name in the midst of our suffering and in every moment of our lives. Thank you, Lori. It's nice to see you in that seat again. I remember years of service in that spot right there. Good morning, and I mean really, really good morning. To the glory of God the Father, he is risen. Through the love of Jesus Christ, he is risen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he is risen. A warm welcome to those of you in the sanctuary. We appreciate you being part of this celebration a warm welcome to those of you joining us online. We appreciate you as well being part of this celebration. Great separations took place about 2,000 years ago that now affect every moment of our lives. The separation between the risen Christ and the tomb that could not hold him. The separation between our forgiveness in the risen Christ and our sins that remain in the tomb. The separation between our old way of life and the transformation into the image of Christ that is empowered by his resurrection. The separation between the old reality of suffering and hopelessness and the new reality of unconditional love and of God's purposes being worked out in everything in our lives. 
Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything has changed. And Christ is now with us in a new way, which we celebrate by saying, the risen Lord be with you. And so was it a morning like this, when the making everything new Christ was raised to make everything new. Our worship continues with a celebration through the musical offering. Was it a morning like this? Followed by a first hymn of the morning, which is a celebratory hymn of praise and thanksgiving. Was it a morning like this when the sun still hid from Jerusalem and Mary rose from her bed to tend the Lord she thought was dead? Was it a morning like this when Mary walked down from Jerusalem and two angels stood at the tomb bearers of news she would hear soon did the grass sing did the earth rejoice to feel you again over and over like a trumpet underground did the earth seem to pound he is risen over and over in a never-ending round he is risen alleluia alleluia was it a morning like this when peter and john ran from jerusalem and as they raced toward the tomb beneath their feet was there a tune? Did the grass sing? Did the earth rejoice to feel you again? Over and over, like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? He is risen. Over and over, in a never ending round, he is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Over and over, like a trumpet underground, did the earth seem to pound? He is risen. Over and over, in a never ending round, he is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. Was it a morning like this? when my lord looked out on jerusalem he is risen hallelujah 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 hallelujah
could have the children come forward. Who knows what today is? Easter. Easter. And I asked some of you already, but what's today all about? God. God, God uh, why do you go to bed? Yes. Is that what you're going to say, Declan? I was waiting for you guys to say Easter eggs. But you guys are too smart. I have a story I want to share with you before our lesson. It's called A Happy Sunday, The Empty Tomb. Sunday morning... Some women went to put burial spices on Jesus' body. They knew a big stone was covering the tomb's entrance and wondered how they would move it. When they arrived, the stone had already been moved. Jesus' body was gone, and there were angels in the tomb. Jesus is alive, the angel said. Go tell his disciples. Do you remember who his disciples were? Yeah. <laughs> the women told the disciples, and Peter and John ran to Jesus' tomb to see for themselves. All they found were Jesus' burial cloths. They went back home, confused. Later, the disciples gathered together in a room. They were talking about what had happened when Jesus appeared to them. They were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. Don't worry, said Jesus. See my hands and my feet? It's me. Touch me. Go on. You can't touch a ghost, and ghosts don't, get, don't eat either, but I'm feeling really hungry. So he ate some fish. Then he taught them. The scriptures are clear, he said. The Messiah was supposed to suffer and die and then be raised from the dead. Now tell the world what you have seen. Let everyone know that their sins can be forgiven if they turn to God. It's possible because of what I have done. So what did Jesus do for us? He rose from the dead, but before that, what happened? He died on the cross for our sins. I don't know why I don't have you tell the story. <laughs> so I have a question. Some of you guys have something like this, don't you? What is it? Easter basket. And what do we put in our Easter basket? Okay. So sometimes you go on a hunt and you find eggs. Who wants to open this one for me? Okay, I'm going to say Declan since he's the oldest and he might like what's inside here. What's in there? <gasps> Whoa! What'd you find? Some toys, a ring, a bracelet bouncy ball. So you got some toys. Okay, I think Charlotte was going to open our next one. Ooh. All right, Charlotte. What's in this one? Hold on, you're next. How about it? You and your brother can get the next. Charlotte, you want to come open this one? There's candy. Okay. I've got one more after this. Okay, you and your brother open this one. What's in there? Okay, go open that with your brother. So, we found toys, we found candy, and money. Okay, Wes is opening the last one. Okay, you and Sam, you go back over there and open that with him and tell me what's in it. What'd you find? No, that wasn't in there. That was Steckland's roller. <laughs> was it empty? <coughs> so who got the best gift? 
Sammy did? <laughs> well, Wes and Sammy opened something that there's nothing, right? And they kind of looked a little confused and sad, right? There you go, Charlotte. Go share with her. So, nothing in an egg. What did that remind us of, though, Wes? Sammy? His disciples went to the tomb, and it was empty. So even though they might not have anything, right, the best thing we can find on Easter morning is that Jesus was not in his tomb, right? Because he rose from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your son came, died on the cross for us, but did not remain dead. He rose so that we might have life everlasting in you. We pray for each of these kids that they would come to know you as Savior and Lord and that they would worship you the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Stick around for some song, and then we'll head back to class. Sound good?
At the deep heart of the Christ-following life is one simple word, a word that we just sang, the word come. This single word represents the constant, never changing, not dependent on anything, free invitation by the creator of the universe. Come is an invitation to come deeper and deeper into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to find the richest joy of fulfillment in him, regardless of symptoms or circumstances or interpersonal situations. Isaiah 55 verses 1 and 2 represents our scriptural call to confession and renewal. The word of God says this, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you have no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. The problem for many of us human beings is that too often we walk past God's invitation to come. Our realization of that misguided way of responding to God's invitation ideally 
leads us to prayers of confession and asking God to draw us back to him and deeper into our relationship with him. O Father of the risen Christ, the Christ who calls us by name amidst our suffering, we are profoundly grateful for your invitation to come, to bring our thirst to you, to be satisfied by your love without cost or condition. Yet, dear God, and yet, we too often find ourselves scooting past your invitation as we chase what is not bread for our souls, what will not quench our thirst. We forsake your invitation to come to you as we labor for things that do not satisfy our hearts and do not draw us closer to you. In the silence of these prayer-filled moments, for whom this particularly applies, Lord, please help us to become fully aware of the unique ways we tend to decline your invitation to come as we pursue our own ways to deal with our hurts and our wounds and our worries, and our desire to be fulfilled. In general, dear Father, for all of us, in our prayers of confession, help us to let go of the ways we move away from you. Help us to embrace the ways that draw us closer to you. Under the enlightening power of your Holy Spirit, in the silence of these sacred moments, we pray our most intimate prayers to you. We are profoundly grateful to you, God, for the incredibly loving sacrifice of Christ on the cross that demonstrated in a way that could be done by no other way his unconditional love for us. We are profoundly grateful, dear God, for the incomparable victory over our old selves that has been won by the resurrection of Christ. He has been raised. We have been transformed. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, we pray, amen and amen. Our scriptural assurance of pardon and renewal for this service represents a benefits review. This is a benefits review, a review of the life-giving benefits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It comes from God through the pen of Paul, Ephesians 1, verses 18 to 20. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. <clears throat> friends, based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power that raised him from the dead, may we live as people of the resurrection. May we, by God's grace alone, live as people who are children of a good, good father who would bestow the amazing benefits of the resurrection upon us. To God be the glory, the glory of the good, good father. Amen and amen. of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and tell that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a 
good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I Always good, Father. Thank you for the resurrection of our King. Thank you for new life, new creation. And this wonderful life we get to live in somewhere between what's coming and what's already been. Huh? We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, and they all said, Amen. Amen. Would you share the peace of our Lord Jesus with one another?
If you could please take your seats by noon, that would be <laughs> very appreciated. That'll give you a little bit of extra time to visit this morning. I was just talking to Jerry. We have 45 minutes of announcements this morning. I just, <laughs> but we feel strongly that we've got it. These are important for our community. <clears throat> That's not true. That's not true at all. We just have a few announcements for our body life to keep track of. We always like to mention those brown connection pads, prayer pads that are there in the pew with you. If you would please fill that out and pass it along and then return it to from whence it came. I don't know if that's proper grammar or not, but you get the picture. Uh, that's helpful because if you're a guest here and the pad comes back to you, you can learn the names of those who are sitting in the pew with you. So we like to do it that way. That's our tradition. Those of you who are guests also, our veterans know this, but those of you who are guests, please feel free to put your prayer requests on there. We would love to have the chance to pray for you. We take those prayer requests very diligently and we would love to have the opportunity to pray for you. And also for those of you who are guests, anybody in your pew with you can help you with what we call a connect card, which should be there in the pew rack in front of you that will generate more contact with us. We would love for you to fill that out. You can place it to in the offering bag when it comes to you in a few minutes or give it to any of us here and we'll get it into the right place. But we'd love to have that extra connection with you. If you purchased an Easter lily, which are beautiful up here and celebratory, if you did, please pick it up after the service so that you can take it home and give it a good home. And please note that the church office will be closed, as is our tradition, the Monday after Resurrection Sunday, so the church office will be closed tomorrow. And now, brothers and sisters, let us welcome in the word of God preached through our doxology. <laughs> Good morning. He is risen. He is, risen. <laughs> he is. Let's go to him in prayer for a moment. Gracious Father, our risen Lord, we are a grateful people here this morning. Father, we come to you in love, in thanksgiving, and in joy for the fact that our sins have been forgiven and the proof of the empty grave. Oh, Father, we are just so, so thankful this morning. We come before you eager to hear your word and to hear the proclamation that is given to us. Father, we ask that you will just bless our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 20. So if you care to follow along, either on the screen or in your bulletin or in your Bibles, this is an awesome thing to do. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture 
that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The word of the Lord.
in here that thank you for this last Good Friday service as well. It was wonderful. We're talking about dreams today. This isn't the I have a dream speech from uh, several decades ago, but when I talk about dreams and nightmares, I'm referring to those that you have usually when you are awake, not when you're asleep. Uh, but those that you have that have some sort of chance of coming true. Uh, we all have dreams that we live by. Sometimes we go to college because we have a dream of what life may be later on. We get married sometimes because we have dreams. We have dreams and we act upon those dreams. These aren't that those, those imaginations that are far from reality, but they are attainable, but... On an Easter morning, over 2,000 years ago, there were some dreams that were just plain crazy that were met on that morning. Things that were beyond any kind of belief. So when I talk about dreams, when I talk about nightmares, I'm talking about those things that may or may not become a reality, good or bad. Easter, no matter how familiar I am with the story, tells me each year that wild dreams are possible. I love the scripture text from the Gospel of John. Of course, John himself is the one that writes himself into the story. He was there. He doesn't name himself the Apostle John. He says the, the, the one whom Jesus loved thought it was interesting that when he reports the incident of how they got down to the tomb, they're almost like brothers. You know, how he reports, oh, Peter and the disciple that uh, Jesus loved ran towards the tomb, and guess who got there first? <laughs> he makes that statement twice. Oh, the one that got there first then went in after Peter came up in the behind place. But while dreams are possible, we see that John and Peter and Mary and the other disciples, they were about to have their wildest dreams met, even if they had not been able to see them up to that point. On May 25th, 1961, there was a 46-minute speech that was delivered before Congress. And in that speech, JFK... John Fitzgerald Kennedy proclaimed that a goal that he had as president that we needed to have as a nation was that there would be a man that would be put on the moon and we would safely return him to earth again. Again, the year was 1961. JFK was not able to see it come to pass in real life. It did happen, however, on July 20th, 1969. We reached the moon and we came back safely again. JFK had been dead six years, six years when that happened. And many wished that as they recall that speech that he said that he would have been able to see it, but he did see it. He dreamed it. He had the vision of what could be in his mind and he knew it could happen. Isn't a dream merely seeing what can happen before it happens? For anything of consequence that has occurred within our world, it starts with a dream. It starts with us saying, what if? What if, and then we see it in our mind's eye, we see it in our heart, and often, but not always, often it comes to pass. A vision, not of what is right now, but a vision of what possibly can be. 
the three years that Jesus spent with his disciples and all of those followers that followed him wherever he went, he was walking and he was talking with them and helping them to understand what the dream was that he was laying down in front of them what was to happen. And to his disciples, when he said that I was going to be betrayed and that I was going to die, but I was going to come back to life, it was too wild. It was too unreachable for them to understand to where when it did happen, again, they were dumbfounded. He was giving them a dream and they were not holding on to it. Jesus saw, he knew what had to happen, even if it was way beyond the disciples could have possibly even imagined. You see, during that particular time, the number one enemy was not Rome, the number one enemy was not Egypt, the number one enemy that needed to be defeated was death. And it could not be defeated up to this particular point. But again and again, Jesus talked of that very possibility and he gave him a hint of it when he raised a man, Lazarus, before he himself went to the cross. What's the southernmost tip of Africa called? That's what it's called now, but you know what it was called before? It was called the Cape of Good Hope. It was called the Cape of Storms. And no European had ever gone all the way around trying to get to the Orient because there were storms that were there. And so they had not managed to make that southern passage from Europe to India via ship. To the ancients, it was known as the Cape of Storms because that's what met them every time they got to that point. In 1587, the first European basically to reach that particular lowest part of Africa, uh, Bartholomew Diaz, he and his crew got to that particular point and his crew refused to go on because they did not know what was on the other side of that point. So they turned back. Nine years later, another Portuguese man, if your junior high history is coming back to you again, another Portuguese guy by the name of Vasco da Gama. Oh, and you're thinking, I don't remember that one. <laughs> he went around the Cape, past the storms, and on to India. The Cape later became known as the Cape of Good Hope. The unpassable, the impossible became passable, became possible. Now, of course, Either of those two things that I've talked about, getting a man to the moon and uh, going around to the southernmost point of Africa, are simple compared to what occurred on Easter morning 2,000 years ago. No one really knew what lay beyond the grave until Easter morning. Jesus, because of what he did in stepping out of that tomb, he conquered death. He passed beyond the storms. He crushed the fears of every human being. And so when Jesus said, because I live, you shall live as well. It takes on a different meaning. Because it's a truth. More than just lip service, much more than some wild dream, it was a dream that was in the mind of God even before we were kicked out of the garden. It had been but a dream, a dream that was just too much for too many people to think of as a reality. And so how we approach life is not as those that believe merely in pipe dreams. We believe in the reality of Christ and what that resurrection means for us, his people and his church. As Christians, we are allowing God to place within us a vision, not of what can't be, but of what can be. Not just uh, in, in relationship to our understanding of death, but in relationship to the life that we live now on this earth, on this side of our last breath. 
You see, Good Friday to Mary and Peter and John and the disciples and every one of those followers, Good Friday was a nightmare and they couldn't get out of it quick enough. Even today, we cannot believe what happened, that humanity would get to the point to where we would kill the one who came to save that had no sin. Upon him was the punishment that was for all of us, the one truly innocent person within the world died for the truly wicked in the world. If Good Friday was a nightmare, then Easter was a dream, a dream come true. Because the Good Friday nightmare was transformed into the Easter dream that Mary walked away with and Peter walked away with and John walked away with and every one of his disciples. The way had been opened for an ending to all nightmares, not just that which we face in the grave but bringing life to our visions of what can be when the kingdom of God comes down. Isn't that what vision is, seeing more than what the eye can see, more than what the ear can hear, more than what we believe can occur, but seeing the uh, mind and a heart that is transformed by the spirit of the risen Lord. We are resurrection people, so... All things are possible. The resurrection means that Christians can expectantly dream of every need being met with abundance, even in the midst of extreme poverty. The resurrection means that that we Christians can expectantly dream of comfort and compassion, even in the midst of the pains of life that we can dream of justice, that we can visualize fairness in the midst of inequity, that we can dream of holiness and grace in the midst of hell, that we can dream of love and all its possibilities in the midst of a world that is filled with hate. That's what resurrection means. It's not just that I'm going to live with God eternally, but it's that I can live with God right now. And these Easter dreams that we have, these are not what I refer to as happiness. It's not happiness. Who says Christians are supposed to be happy? There's nowhere in Scripture where it says we're supposed to be happy. Christians are supposed to dream dreams, dreams that are given to us by God. We put too much emphasis on on looking happy and being happy instead of joyfully dreaming the dreams of God. Even though we have the right to pursue happiness, our, our, our founding fathers wrote that into the document that propels us forward as a nation We have the right to pursue happiness, but even that does not guarantee that we will be happy. Happiness may be hollow. It's time for Christians to tolerate no further nonsense about happiness and instead grasp the concept of joy. The first century world, when the followers of Christ fanned out from the Holy Land, did not say, See how happy those Christians are when the persecution was coming around? You know, the the world didn't say, oh, I want to be a part of that group because they're happy even though they're getting beat up. The world said, see how those Christians love each other. See how those Christians love us. You see, Christians are not necessarily happier than non-Christians at least as the world defines happiness. But we are more joyful and we risk more in our dreamings and we can tolerate more because we know that there is more than just what we are currently feeling. There's so much more. Easter dreaming is not about happiness. Easter dreaming is about grabbing hold of the promise that God has that things will be made better and all things one day will be made right. You see, Christians may or may not be more happy than non-Christians. Joy, on the other hand, 
is the condition of gladness in spite of pain. Delight in spite of waiting. It's not in situation, it's in being. If we are happy, then it's about the situation. But if we are joyous, we feel goodness in spite of what's going on in life. Happiness is not a fundamental category of Christian living. It's not. But joy is. Joy is a category that we are asked and, and, and we are given the means by which we can operate in. Joy is the stuff Easter dreams are made of. God did not put us on earth to be happy. God put us on earth to be in relationship with him and be in relationship with those that are around us and to find joy in that. Joy that comes from Easter dreams. It was with, new, with renewed dreams of Easter joy that the women, when they encountered uh, the, the, what occurred, they raced back to tell the other disciples what they knew. Christ is arisen, they said. Christ is arisen. The Easter dream that makes all dreams possible, it's, it's here. It's upon us. And how can these Easter dreams affect our world now? <clears throat> I say that, that what God gives us is not for on the other side of death. What God gives us, we can experience here and now. Do you remember when the Berlin Wall came down? I, don't re I remember when it happened. I had been to Germany before uh, when the wall was still there, but uh, in, in 1989 is when the wall came down. Why did the Berlin Wall come crashing down? There were many factors, many factors that, that worked into it. It was the perfect storm, but a significant number feel it was because of a, one church in Leipzig, Germany. In East Germany, Kikolai Protestant Church, they began dreaming the resurrection dream. Its pastor, Christian Fuhrer, believed that it was time that the Christian church stop diluting the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to proclaim the strength that comes from Christ in every individual's life and in every community where Christ is introduced and followed, not only over sin and death, but also over captivity, even those that were behind the wall. So his church started some prayer meetings on Monday evenings, praying this church's witness would change their little part of the world. Prayer meetings that began with the Easter dream that all things are possible with God. And within a short time, in his own words, the people praying encountered, he said, in our services and meetings, the miraculous experiences of feeling the effect of the word of God and its impact upon our life. It transformed them, and the pastor reports that God's presence was with them. It was with all of us, he said. And soon the number of prayers swelled to over 200,000 people, most of whom were non-Christians, but were drawn by this resurrection dreaming, some pretty wild dreams that it could impact our world today. And it was these prayers who poured out from one of those Monday night meetings, poured from the meeting on that faithful, fateful Monday evening to protest in the streets. Wir sind das Volk. We are the people. And created the movement that toppled the Berlin Wall. It wasn't Ronald Reagan say, take down this wall. It was the people that were behind it. Now, our dream of resurrection may not look like that German church. Our Easter dream may not be of finally finding fulfillment. The countenance that has eluded us our entire life. Our Easter dream may be of a community where every life is precious, where every person is valuable, young and old. A dream that sin has lost its power over us and we now are no longer slaves. 
And that sin loses its attractiveness to the world. We can believe in such a day. A dream in which the glory of Christ is realized even by the most callous of people. The disciples and the women on that Easter morning 2,000 years ago had their worldly nightmares just crushed by what happened to them on that Thursday night and that Friday hanging on the cross and Saturday's absent. Those were all nightmares. And their eyes had run dry of tears and their hearts were breaking within them to where they could not possibly hurt anymore. And, you know, the cross, however, was finished by that empty tomb, by a visit from the one who had been dead but now is no longer dead but is alive. That opened their imaginations, that opened their heart, and that opened their minds to set their vision on the possibilities of God's grace, not only as we draw our last breath, but the possibilities of what God can do in our world today. Endless possibilities. And that is what Easter means to me. That what can man do to me? But God is at my side. God is in my heart. If I fear not even death and sin has no longer a grip on me, then there is no need to fear any man. There is no need to fear any government. There is no need to fear any hardship. There is no need to fear even death itself. That's the joy of Easter, brothers and sisters. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us pray. We thank you, God, that you put to death, death itself, that you defeated fear, that you got rid of anguish with an empty tomb. Lord, may we this morning see that even our worst nightmares are no match for the wild dreams that you make realities in our lives and in our world. So help us, Lord, to dream Easter dreams and to live victorious lives as this spring meets us with all of the potential, that which we can see and that which we can't even see as of yet. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we come now to our time and our service for our offering, may we be mindful that God has always given. God gave us this world in which we live. God gave us the sunlight, the trees, the plants. God has given us everything. God has given us this day. If you really stop and think about it, God has given you the breath that you are breathing right now. What have we given to God? Now is a good time to give. Our operatory prayer this morning, gracious God, you have given us the ultimate gift in the death and the resurrection of your Son. We humbly offer these gifts to you, consecrate them to your use, that the ministry of this congregation might serve as a witness to those who still doubt. In Jesus' name, amen.
Would you please stand with us this morning for our closing hymn, Christ the Rose. benediction this morning. Now go in the power of the risen Christ to work, to live, and serve, for the resurrection has changed everything. You have nothing to fear, nothing whatsoever. You are never alone. Sin and death will not have the final word. So, go in peace, for the risen Christ is alive. Amen and amen. Thanks be to God. I beat you.